Thank you very much for your introduction, and especially many thanks to Professor Anger to, to invite us here for the invitation. Actually, it is our. Actually, I, I will I will leave I will leave that copy of the presentation, so it's not necessary to record it. I will I will give you the copy of that. I mean, we usually oh. record uh, all seminars if we're in the other room. Ah, okay, okay. So anyway, uh, it is our second visit to uh, your university here. So uh, I will go very fast with some general information because uh, I can see that probably only professor uh, already have seen it, but the other people maybe not so very fast. Uh, so what are the objectives of our meeting? Is just to try to, to establish some uh, specific cooperation between faculties because in fact just there's not such a thing like a general cooperation with two universities. It's always cooperation between some particular uh, faculties and based on this cooperation we can build some other activities. So so please feel free to, to spread out this information which I'm trying to together with my colleague present here to your colleagues uh, who maybe are in similar area research area. So it is the purpose of, of the visit, my presentation. So I will not go very deep into some uh, 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 scientific topic, but of course, if you if you uh, if you want to, to ask me some questions, please feel free. Uh, so it was about about the uh, objectives of our meetings. So few information about university, uh, about college, uh, and and also some possible research cooperation, both about uh, my side, which is more like hardware, Internet of Things, uh, and also Shimon will, will tell a bit about the software part. Uh, so it's about me, but it was already presented by uh, Jason, so so you know moreover what I'm doing in Poznan. Uh, our university is between uh, Warsaw and Berlin, and so it is German and, and it is uh, Russia here and Belarus here, Czech Republic, uh, so as to South Africa. So as you see from, we are, I wouldn't say in the middle of Europe, but but <laughs> but it's very very close everywhere from from Poland. So we can visit basically in a, from Poznan to Berlin is like a two and a half hour driving. Uh, uh, so how do you? Uh, if you had to come to your place, how do you go, from, let's say, from Miami to? Yes, yeah, so you go first to Frankfurt or Munich. Oh, Frankfurt and Munich. Okay. And, and from both airports, you can go uh, anywhere. Poznan, ah. Gdańsk, where the conference was. There are quite frequent connections between those uh, hubs ah. in Germany and Poznan, so ah, usually yeah. a couple of flights a day. I see, I see. Okay. So it's not a problem. So basically, in terms of, let's say, uh, what is interesting in Poland as a country, uh, usually when I have a foreigners as a guest in my country, I used to show them Krakow, which is not uh, shown here, but it's somewhere here on the Vistula River. It is very old historic uh, uh, city, which was not destroyed during the Second War. So it is a nice place to visit. And also over there is a very unique in the world uh, uh, underground salt mine uh, that you can go about 300 meters down and you can see like a, a small city like a small city over there so including some rooms and, and such kinds of stuff uh, it is what I mentioned during the lunch that there are uh, uh, OECD ranking whatever it means abbreviation I'm not sure but you can find it on the web so that you can you can have this uh, you have this eleven uh, uh, topics and based on that you can you can rank countries. So for example, in terms of safety, Poland is which surprised me actually a bit. That Poland is the second in the world in terms of uh, safeness. So so it is why it's one of the reasons why I invite you to go to <laughs> Poland. Of, of, of course of course income is not probably that such a good in such a good position, uh, especially in comparison to the US. The US uh, not in the top list. Uh, sorry? US is not in the top ten. Uh, it, in oh, terms of in terms of safeness. <laughs> so, but probably later you can find average, so you can cut uh, from those eleven uh, uh, points and uh, where where it's it's nice uh, place to live. Actually, now especially for software people, it's so called uh, to be it's, it's to nomad. Yeah, nomad is a person uh, because it's the name of a historic is a person who was uh, traveling in the uh, in the. Uh, uh, 
desert, desert, and so they stop somewhere. But now, especially software people, they can live anywhere. So they can just travel in all the time. But everything what they need is just an internet connection and a computer. So it is a, that's a better way you will stay in some point. So a few words about Poznan. It is uh, the fifth, actually, the fifth biggest city in Poznan, in Poland. But the, the third in terms of academic uh, uh, number of students and higher education institution. Uh, it is our very old building which still exists because we started our university in 1919 and we are now our new, actually not new, it's like a 10 years old building where our, our uh, college is located over there. Uh, so as I mentioned before, we have uh, 10 colleges, uh, 21,000 students, so as I heard, a little bit less than in your university and everything else as a typical university. And it is where the, our campus is located, so it is a city of Poznan over there, and what is nice that we are located basically similar as you, just in the city, so it's not like a out, out of the city campus, but it is in downtown of the city, so people, students can do some interesting stuff in the leisure time, let's say, over there. Uh, our faculty computing, uh, one of those dance uh, faculty. Uh, here you can see some interiors, because I put here the best pictures. <laughs> so uh, we have also some old buildings. History, the first uh, computer science started at 1976. And uh, now we, we, all, we change names of our colleges. In, in original, it, it was uh, electrical engineering college. And next, it was uh, changing, and finally, now we are computing uh, science, College of Computing and Science. Uh, so, as I mentioned, those old buildings here and new over there. So, this other look. Uh, we have uh, actually three basic, basic uh, in our structure of our college consists of an uh, Institute of Computing Science, Automation and Robotics. And also we have a very unique European Center for Bioinformatics and Genomics. And it is a new, a new, relatively new thing and a lot of uh, grants are attracted to, to this stuff. Uh, so we have, a, uh, in terms of number of students I already mentioned, but we have a typical three programs, I mean undergraduate, graduate and PhD programs. Um, and now, uh, okay, uh, let me go a little bit faster here. So, fields of study, um, the same as here, I guess. Yeah, three and a half years of undergraduate and one and a half of graduation master program. And specialization, uh, so basically it is like that you uh, enter computing, computer science program, and next you can choose uh, one of those specialization. Uh, I noticed that there are some mistakes I copied two times. <laughs> So, but of course, you know, software development technology is very important. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> well, the same is about mobile embedded applications, as you see. It's also important because it looks <laughs> too nice here. Okay, anyway, my mistake, sorry about that. Automatic in the robotics, that one is a very unique one because we have a pro joint program, that like a kind of double degree, uh, uh, also with the University of Evelyn from France. So it's like a three semesters. One semester is students are in our university. The second one is in France, and the third one they can choose whatever they prefer. So this kind of competition between France and and, and Poland. Uh, bioinformatic, it's, it's a relatively new program, but not so many students. But but in terms of publications, it is uh, of course very good area because there is a lot of possibility to publish. Good, in a good journals topic over there. We, we are also well known in terms of student achievements. I already presented it last time, so let's go further. Uh, and now some areas of scientific research. Here you can you can uh, read it. So typical stuff probably you can find in any uh, faculty, well, any any colleges of computer science. But here maybe to be more specific, okay, more specific. See here, operational research, artificial intelligence. It is uh, we have a 
a few very well-known professors. One is professor of English who established actually is one of the uh, researchers who established this operational research back like uh, 30 years ago. Uh, professor Bajewicz, Słowinski, uh, so probably people who are working in this area, they will uh, recognize those names. Intelligent decision support, it is area of uh, Shimon Wertz, um, uh, medical informatics is also very close to your area of interest, so I will give a... Um, so a, the medical informatics program, do you work with any medical school? Y yes, yes, we have a close connections with many medical, uh, not only schools, but also with the uh, hospitals. Okay. So for example, right now one of my research is just to, to analyze the influence of the radiation, uh, to the um, chest, uh, I don't know in, in English, I mean, what is the uh, side effects of this uh, cancer treatment using radiation. So it is based on based on tomography uh, images, we, we try to do some some uh, research on that. And Shimon will, will tell us a bit more. So it's mostly for the processing of the data or embedding something in humans? No, no, it is just processing data which we have some from tomography. But also, uh, in my case, I also try to, uh, to prepare some devices which can be, for example, implantable into, in, into your body. But right, right now I'm thinking not to implant it into a human body, rather in the water pipelines. <laughs> it's, but, no, but actually, we, at least at this stage, we work rather with data because it's easier also from the perspective of going through all the ethics checks because you don't have to deal directly with patients, but you have the data and then you don't have even to approach patients. So yeah. it's safer and usually it's easier, much easier to get an approval for, for a study like this. So basically it is what, as you see, Shimon already wanted to tell a little bit. So Shimon, uh, please uh, continue. I just, so there are some other uh, competences. There's a typical information system, let's say old fashioned. The next one is uh, also, well, no, I'll go name algorithm design program, but here you have all of those bioinformatic things and protein data analysis. And to be more specific, few examples of our some specific research area, and I will ask uh, Shimon to explain a little bit. Yeah, because uh, I'm uh, uh, from the lab of intelligent decision support, which can be seen as a, well, now we use this, this term data science for this, but we deal with various forms of, of decision support, including uh, data mining and also preference modeling, preference application uh, to make more informative decisions. Uh, here you can see some examples of uh, the research we are conducting and the projects we uh, we are working on or we, we have completed. So uh, we, we focus on traditional machine learning uh, approaches. Uh, and I would say one of the fields within the, the whole area of machine learning is, is dealing with imbalance data sets. So they, they occur quite frequently. So I would say network applications like, for example, uh, intrusion detection uh, is very typical case, so it's always cited as a perfect example of imbalanced data. Medical medicine, well, medical problems uh, are the other well-known example. So this is what we are uh, dealing with. Uh, maybe, well, I will talk about it a uh, bit more. Uh, but we, well, there are different approaches, and in fact, we try to promote at least to some extent approaches that capture the knowledge in a readable form because quite often you have to you have to consult the knowledge with a human expert and then it's good to, to have it uh, expressed in a form that is easy to comprehend therefore uh, quite frequently we use decision rules and here there is a, a methodology called rough sets not fuzzy sets but rough sets and actually it allows you to capture knowledge and in terms of decision rules, it allows you to deal with inconsistent data in terms of missing values, inconsistent values, values inconsistent in terms of user preferences. So actually, it's quite a powerful tool for that can be used in many uh, many applications. So here you can see some specific, more specific applications of uh, of uh, rough set methodology. This one was about uh, identifying relevant features and rules and, and uh, some. Biomedical, actually, it was about drugs. So, uh, then uh, we have a group of people working on, on optimization problems. So actually, this would be more like operational research. Uh, and actually, it's a, it's an interesting uh, thing because 
I used to, to work for some time at the University of Padova, so th there was a very clear distinction between uh, management and computer science, so operational research was part of management. And actually, at our university or at our faculty, uh, management, uh, sorry, operational research is also, a, I would say, quite strong part of, of, of computer science. Therefore, we, we have people working on, opt on optimization algorithms, so, for example, different trans transportation problems. And it's really interestingly, some people also created a spin off company, which is similar to Google, uh, well, Google Maps, so they also. Uh, uh, they, they allow services for online planning, uh, route planning, route, route monitoring, and, and replanning. So I would say our competencies are like, quite strong in this, in this area. This is another example. Actually, this one, this, or, or this is uh, an example of our competencies associated with uh, data, data series analysis. So we had several projects with industry where we were trying to analyze their data and to predict, for example, the necessary level of production or the necessary level of employment. And actually, it was a quite interesting project because they, they wanted to know in advance how many people they would need on a specific day because if they would have been able to, to, to schedule people for specific days in advance, then they would not need to, to pay for uh, or after hours, so so it's, it's quite. So, what type of approach you use for tenses prediction? Well, to tell the truth, I was not involved directly into. I was well, actually, I was in this project. However, my part was database and a client application. There was some heuristic. There was another colleague working on this, so he was trying to combine several approaches because we tried to first. We started with the basic ones like this typical data series analysis with with trend and and this. I really, I really yeah, but it didn't work so well. So he was trying to uh, to combine several approaches. Now I'm not sure because it it, uh, it was completed many uh, several years ago. But I think he even tried to well, I mean, girl, but this this uh, somehow resonates in my mind. Genetic program. You so have a computational fine. finance program. Uh, sorry, a finance engineering program. Uh, so actually, at our university, we no, not we don't. at our faculty. We don't. We don't. There is a separate faculty. Uh, which is uh, management, uh, management and engineering. Yeah. So they again this this part associated with uh, uh, with uh, operational research is also to some extent. Yeah, Grant wants to say that's a stock price. <laughs> yeah. So actually, no. This is. Uh, I think this is from this. Uh, I uh, this project where we are trying to predict the level of of. Uh, Production for actually it was a bulk factory, one of the largest bulk factories in Poland, and they were trying to predict yearly, well, a year in advance their production levels. Uh, and then you, you can see here some uh, some topics related to preference modeling and, and preference, uh, uh, well, discovery and and then application. So we are developing methods for capturing preferences. For example, we ask a well user decision maker. Express preferences in terms of or using several comparisons of, of well known situations, and from those comparisons, we, we try to build more general models capturing preferences, for example, uh, related to well, some choices. And this could be, for example, applied to a situation when we try to look inside customers' head. Uh, then we also have a group working on image analysis, and they are quite strong. Uh, and uh, now, as almost everybody, they use deep learning networks. And they are quite, I mean, this methodology is quite powerful, and they are quite successful. So, uh, I, they, there was, uh, well, there's one, uh, or there are at least several data sets with uh, Fundus images that are used as a benchmark. So, uh, I think it was two years ago they published a paper in, in DMC medical imaging. And actually, they, they managed to beat like 70 other approaches, and they were very uh, satisfied because their general network, deep uh, neural network, was able to beat more expert-driven approaches that were specialized to this uh, very, very specific tasks. A very specific task. So, uh, I won't go into very detailed uh, details here. So we have. So actually, our group is is very concerned with artificial intelligence. I would say in the old sense, like. Uh, expert-based systems, but also in the new sense, neural networks with optimization, with data analysis. Uh, we also have colleagues working on artificial life uh, and evolutionary computation. 
And then we also have other teams working on more, I would say, traditional topics, for example, distributed systems. Uh, uh, we also, yeah, they, they work on also on social network analysis. Uh, you can see some examples. Uh, th there is a group that deals with uh, databases. So they, they, they are strongly involved into databases, but they also deal now with, uh, with uh, data mining. So it seems we are slowly converging. Uh, and those are traditional databases or like, mm. both? Because, uh, the well, in the past there was a clear separation. We were doing the data mining and they were working on databases. But actually now it's quite difficult to separate now. So now we are slightly more into databases and they are more into data mining. So we are approaching generally the same, the same problem but well, from two different uh, perspectives. Uh, yeah. This is what we also do, so I guess we may share some experience. So as you may well guess, so these are those guys that work on images. They rely on, on GPUs uh, because traditional computing won't, uh, won't make it possible to well, but, but this, this, this project was also involved to this uh, financial thing because uh, oh, yeah. a rock company wanted to, they have a models how to invest money in, uh, in uh, options, stock options. And, and they wanted us to uh, somehow to speed it up, I mean, the calculation of the, of the model. So it was by GPUs who was... was and then, uh, yeah, a few words, it is, it is actually my area of, of interest. Uh, but I have another presentation, so maybe I will tell a little bit more about that in the next presentation. Uh, so, just to finish this general part, uh, as I mentioned, we, we have uh, uh, some kind of uh, environment and, and which, which will allow us to do all of those research mentioned before. So uh, basically, already mentioned about the European Center of Bioinformatics and Genomics. It is something really new and interesting thing. But so the software and on the other side, it is my area. So we also provided, we have a possibility to design a center for fabrication uh, uh, OPIX in the latest technology, as you see, uh, 28 nanometers even. Uh, so basically, this is a few pictures from our classes here, rooms and a general view of our city. Here, again, our main building and classrooms over there. We have uh, some uh, scientific circles groups for, for students, as you see, as everywhere. And uh, last year, actually two years ago, we were hosting the Euro 2016, so it is uh, uh, about 2,000 people uh, over there. So probably you heard about that, this conference. Uh, and some others, of course. Oh, it, is, it was actually 28th European conference, and, and Professor Hellman uh, was uh, in a plenary, he had a plenary lecture over there. Uh, we have a cooperation, actually, it is in terms of Europe here, as you see. Uh, in terms of uh, student exchange in Erasmus program, we have uh, possibility to, to, to make this exchange all over the Europe. And what is interesting, even if you, for example, send some students to study in Poland, which is relatively cheap, uh, they can study, for example, one semester in our country, and next, using this Erasmus exchange program, they can go for the study another semester somewhere else. So in this case, student can uh, can visit several places in, in Europe and we will pay them a little bit like a kind of scholarship to, to be able to study abroad. Uh, so we also offer this uh, kind of uh, European doctorate, the PhD program uh, here with a cooperation with those universities. We also have next to our university, we have a close connection with the supercomputing uh, network, which is actually a main, uh, a main hub of uh, uh, internet in Poland. And you can also see here actually a map of Poland. So basically those green, uh, there are main hubs of the internet, but at the, same, at the same time there are the biggest cities in Poland. And I already mentioned about Krakow, which is also interesting from this tourist point of view, capital of Poland here, our city, Poznan here, Apidines, actually it was famous because of the solidarity and Valenza, the person who, who, who helped us to collapse, to collapse communist, it was, everything started in Gdańsk. 
not all people knows about that. I mean, well known is a German uh, crash of the wall, but in fact, everything started here in, in, in Gdansk. At Poznan uh, is our city over there. So, just a cooperation as usually, so I just put here some well known marks that brands that we cooperate with. Another one over there, and over there here. Uh, so, as I said before, the cooperation between institutions always cooperation between people. So it is why it is important for us that maybe uh, some of you or your colleagues will be will be interested to cooperate, and it must be always win-win. Okay, so profitable for for both sides. Basically, it is uh, that it is the end of the, this general part of the. Uh, of of, of uh, my presentation, and another one more specific is about my research area. So just a few, maybe I will not go too deeply in, 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 into this. But however, uh, so I will present some areas of my interest. Again, please share this information with your colleagues if not you are interested in it, and some more details. So basically, what we are doing with my group of people. We are actually five, uh, five people involved in this in general topics. So I, I, I see design. We are using mental graphics tools, and we, we have access to, as I mentioned, and now six, actually recently we pre, we manufactured, we produced, fabricated 60, 65 nanometers AC. But but we are also we are also able and we really have a technology device for 20, uh, 25 nanometer technology and basically it is a Taiwan microsystem uh, or a, uh, or Austria microsystem uh, uh, Taiwan national production I guess something like that or, or uh, Austria microsystem fabrication we, we can you do it in directly in like the university campus or no 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 no, no 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 we send it you just design oh. layout and you send the file uh, with the layout the fabrication uh, no, such a such a uh, let's say state of the art technology is, is impossible to have at the mm. at the university. RIT, for example, over there we have a uh, but it is one micro, one micro old old fashioned technology. But still, it's good for uh, students to, to to learn technology issues over there. But when it comes to the real stuff nowadays, you need a nanotechnology, and it is really really expensive to get. So of course, all of those issues related to embedded system. Now I added Internet of Things, which is very popular word. So I included it. So all of those uh, things which we try to implement in hardware, some kind of, for example, uh, image processing accelerators or some other stuff. And we are also involved in this image processing, cryptography, biomedical signals. A uh, few examples uh, of our design, and that is. Please believe in that it is a true uh, picture that we really fabricated the chip and we, we measure it. Sometimes some of them even work. <laughs> so it is like this. Uh, we are also doing uh, preparing kind of CAD, CAD tools or computer aided engineering tools for, for uh, analog or mixed analog digital design. Uh, as you know, it is it is very easy to prepare such a tools that exist. There are, exist many tools to, to, to design digital circuits, which is very easy. However, it's not so easy for analog. They must be very specific for a specific class of circuits. So we are using, for example, this VHDL AMS or Verilog AMS as a as a way how we describe the circuits and we we try to to help people with this our tools to, to, to design some specific things. Uh, and also I already mentioned that we, we are dealing with all of those latest platforms and the system. Our latest uh, project was to, to have a, a car with a camera over there and we, we just uh, traveling with the car and we are making images uh, of that road. And next, using image processing, we are trying to find the crashes, cracks of the pavements of the road. So instead of you know walking through the highway and looking on the on the road where there are cracks, 
we are just uh, implemented here image processing algorithms. So you got a good group of people working in cryptography. Uh, and we also have uh, people working. Because we have a lot of, you know, some good people are working uh, here too. So the, basically that one is based on the, like a cryptography but using this uh, house-based analog uh, systems. Yeah. So we are working on that also. Actually, we have uh, this colleague who is involved in that. Uh, he made a PhD together with uh, his supervisor. Was actually from 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 uh, the right, not the right, the right University of New York, I guess. So they, they did it to, together. Uh, I was right. Okay, and and just as an example, of what we are doing in this implantable chips, basically my. Very short, very narrow, let's say, specific topic was this current mode sigma delta modulator dedicated modulation modulators dedicated for this uh, small chips. So, so one of the possibilities uh, is uh, that um, it is just to, I like this transparency because it shows you that, for example, our hair is 100 micron. Can I ask a question before we go in more detail? So you mentioned IoT, uh, and your description is like you focus on hardware, focus on the local processing. Uh, what about the networking aspect? Uh, it's uh, it's not my area of interest, but we have of course many colleagues. Uh, yes, we have a, well, the group that is called Networking and Distributed Systems Group. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, they are quite specialized in aspects related to distributed systems, from, both from theoretical perspe perspectives and practical perspectives. So they deal with all those concurrency issues, mm -hmm. uh, well, issues with writing, reading, cache, and, and so on. So in my, in my you know, case, you I meant like uh, how information is being exchanged between those IoT devices, and including uh, this implantable device. It's you will see I have some transparencies over there that at some point really it's necessary to have uh, to, to, to be able to send the information outside. Of course, I, I have some transparencies. But what, why I like it because it's 100 micro in our, our hair. Whereas right now uh, we have a 13 nanometers. So you can imagine that in one hair you have you, you can have the whole devices. Yeah. So 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 this tra the next transparency that. You can imagine that each each uh, slice here is one hair, so like a James Bond can just uh, shake the hairs and he can do everything, including, for example, have a have a, a, a microphone or, or, or microphone or, or, or camera, of course. Or maybe someone can ask, what about what about power supply? It already exists that we have a working circuit that's shaking. You can generate generate uh, energy, so it's just working. How circuits. big? Uh, how small the smallest? Uh, and no, that device. one is not very small. As you see, it is it is it is it's not a, it's not prepared for the integration integration in an electric mm -hmm. circuit. I'm just showing that it is it's not a, like a science fiction that you can shake your uh, hand uh, or, or, or hair and you can generate energy. But what is important that of course my what I'm dealing with is must be. Uh, low, ultra low energy power consumption of the circuit which uh, which I am designing. Uh, so uh, and also they have to be of course small just to be able to, for example, implant it. So just a few abbreviations which in the area what we are working on. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's a good idea just to explain the abbreviation. Otherwise, uh, audience can ask presenter, and sometimes we don't know <laughs> that uh, what does it mean. Uh, like uh, 20 years ago, I used to show this transparency that we are working on such a chip that in the future we will be able to do it. It was this slide. This transparency has about 20 years or 10 for sure. But now it's already done. Our colleagues in Lausanne, uh, they already, for example, it is an example of of the. Uh, uh, ASIC, which is responsible to, to test your gl uh, glucose in your blood. So it is 2 millimeters over 14 millimeters, and it is working cheap. Uh, so uh, a US company, Microchip, provides that. So here you measure what about the, your level of the glucose in your blood, and next depends on the results here. You can apply in insulin, whatever you need. And it is also working circuit uh, from microchip te technology, microchip company from US. 
and it is of course remotely connected with your smartphone, or whatever that you can using telemetry, you can you can you can uh, control it. Uh, it was even uh, fake news in in, uh, in the U.S. at some point. People who blame Obama about the, this Obama, Obama care. It was a, a fake uh, uh, email uh, going around the U.S. that uh, Obama is going to implant all people this RFID as just to to prove it. It was given this uh, this picture, whereas this picture in fact was about about a uh, chip uh, which was responsible for the glucose monitoring. So it's <laughs> it's not exactly a chip to 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 have RFID over there. But of course. If we are talking about this implantable electronics, we have to fulfill all of those requirements which are listed here. And, and uh, so some of them are really challenges. Uh, and I think one keyword is missing security. Uh, of course, you are right, you are right, it's, uh, it's missing. Yeah, you're absolutely right, so no one will, will, will interfere with you. Somehow, it is also about security here, let's say, but, but you are absolutely right, I should add it here. Uh, what we can measure right now, so, so uh, in fact, such a system consists of three things. Uh, you will see somewhere over there later. Well, wait, wait, let me go maybe here. We have like a three levels. Uh, one is a sensing platform, which I'm not expert in it. <laughs> and next, the second one is a this integrated circuit, electronic circuit, which we are working with. And the last one is for, is a, for the uh, uh, charging the uh, ASIC and also for the transmission. So, for example, uh, the first is sensing plate. For example, you can put their uh, sensors to be able to, to, to monitor, to read, to the, the, um, the following the following things uh, and one of the example of this uh, uh, chip which can be responsible for for uh, uh, glucose uh, uh, analyzing so it is actually based on amperometric and it is why just example why my current mode sigma delta modulators which are part of uh, analog to digital converters are very useful because uh, it, it can be directly connected to this uh, parametric based glucose sensor. And so the, the things we are talking about uh, can be just built in somewhere there. So basically my part is, uh, my, my part is somewhere over there, just a, a data acquisition union, including analog to digital converter. So current is, of course, as soon as possible after maybe some analog preprocessing, is converted to digital and next uh, and next transmitted out of the body. Uh, so it is what we are basically doing. So as you see, it is a typical current mode. You can see current mirror over there, and uh, next goes my stuff. So this part, basically, in our project, we use our colleagues' uh, uh, research results from France. So they were they are responsible for the sensing part. Uh, they have a good results. All of them all of them can be can be included on the on the, on the sensing platform, and it, it works with a pretty good accuracy. Uh, the technologies, for example, nanotubes technologies and such kind of stuff. So basically, for me, they just provide me either uh, current or voltage, so I, I'm not going to go very deeply inside the sensors. They just provide me the measurement. Uh, so typical uh, structure of such an implantable chips can be, can be described in this way. Uh, so my part comes in the beginning, as I mentioned, the sigma delta modulator goes at the first preprocessing of the of the acquired data, which are given in the, as a current over there, and and uh, at some point, of course, we have to go out with the data from our body. I will skip this part. It's uh, actually some basic <coughs> information about sigma delta technique. So basically, it is a combination, as you know, oversampling and noise shaping. So typically, we have a quantization noise is like that, and uh, thanks to oversampling, we can we can make it. Uh, uh, not so high, and when we have our uh, band of interest somewhere here, the green and uh, uh, 
parasitic noise actually here is much lower than uh, for the uh, uh, Nyquist uh, type analog to digital converters. And on top of it, when we, when we add uh, uh, sh uh, noise shaping, so it is sigma delta technique. As you see, we can shape the, the noise even even more. So the area of interest in our, our event here is even less. Of course, the total area under the the curve is the same as at the beginning, but the part which which uh, is uh, in our let's say it would be our our uh, border of our frequency, it's much smaller. And we have a different structure, first order, second order, uh, also mass structure. So it is one of the examples of what we did. Uh, actually, it is combination hybrid one, active integrator and passive integrator comparator. And we achieved so this, for example, integrator in terms of lower level, transistor level looks not so complicated. Uh, RC filter is even less, of course. But finally, uh, this comparator, uh, and finally, what we get, what we get, it is uh, quite a good uh, characteristic. So, those theoretical curve which we, we saw before, it is like this because it is our input signal, and we want to have a noise as uh, lower as possible. So, SNDR should be as big as as possible. And it is something just to, to compare different solutions. We have, for example, this figure of merit, which tells you that of course we we would prefer less power, uh, more more accuracy, so effective number of bits, and everything must be as fast as possible. So sampling frequency. So it means the figure of merit in this uh, figure of merit in this case, the uh, figure of merit, as well. If it is lot, uh, smaller, it's better. So as you see here, uh, the uh, continuous time, which was presented on the previous transparencies, is 59, and uh, my uh, the best result was uh, 37, uh, in comparison to some other. As you see, it's quite good. And uh, we we implemented in a 60 uh, 65 nanometer technology. Uh, just to save money, uh, just together with our colleagues from Nova University of Lisbon, to save money, we just put several chips. In this case, two chips in one in one die, and and next, of course, we had in order to reach the spats, we had this uh, uh, eagle, eagle uh, needles. needles, needles, yeah, needles to to touch the the points, uh, and just. I mentioned I was talking about implantable chips, but frankly speaking, to be able to implant anything to the human body, it's, it's really a lot of paperwork and, and it's not so easy. So with the idea right now, which actually, as I mentioned, we applied for the grant together with the colleagues from Lisbon, and it was actually uh, uh, dedicated for Brazilian. It is just that we can implant our chips inside the uh, water pipe pipes, and we are able to make to sense to, to sense some parameters of the water. So the general idea is like that. So that one is already done and it works quite good. The other pa uh, parts uh, is needed. I mean, if if you are interested to join us in this project, basically this part we we have uh, one of the possible solutions from this uh, France colleagues from France. And the structure, just to make a 3D uh, structure of the ASIC, uh, our colleague from Krakow is, is able to help us. But in this case, in this project, we had a cooperation. We had a cooperation with with the people from Italy, so they were able to put it together. So probably you know this chunk, the, this picture that right now we are not only talking about more more, so going down with the scaling. And of course, going down is good for digital, but but in terms of analog, if you are in the nanometers, it's it's much uh, uh, it's it's almost impossible, for example, to to, to get a good amplifier, because we are uh, in, in together with the scaling of the size, you also scale the power supply. So if it is a, a small small uh, uh, power supply, you are close to the noise margin. So in fact. Uh, 
a, it's good for digital, but it's a real challenge for the analog. And always you have at the beginning analog preprocessing because our word is analog. And another one is more than more, which means that uh, we are we are trying to include as much as possible a functionality in our A6 system and chips and so on. So we are we are we are talking some about some sense of actuators uh, which we are working on. So all of those uh, small things seems to be really interesting. So here we have the smart dust, for example. Here we have a microchip which can be installed in your uh, in your contact lens and, and can analyze uh, also um, uh, level of, of glucose. It is some spy drone. It, it was also a picture which I found on the internet. But but later when I presented it first time to my colleagues, he told me, no, it's, it's not true. It was just a, it was a fake news. So it's it's not yet such a small drone. <laughs> it doesn't work. But the other stuff here, uh, absolutely, it's already done. So you can you can you can for, for example you can have a for for. For example, in this, all of this forensic stuff, you can use the smart dust, like the, for example, put it in the in the in, 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 in money, so you can track where the money goes, or you can put it on, on the body somewhere. You don't you don't even feel that you have this smart uh, uh, dust, and you can be localized every, everywhere. So it's just our ID. So basically, it is what I wanted to present in terms of my uh, my personal area of, of, of research. So please share this information with your colleagues and if someone is interested in some of those things. So at the beginning, I presented some general things and those were very specific about this current mode, sigma delta modulators. But right now, frankly speaking, is probably more people are going more to the system level. It's no longer people are interesting to go very deeply into the transistor level. Now, and the same actually in our group that we are going to the system level and trying to, to combine existing solutions to be able to to build, for example, this uh, uh, smart sensors or water. Uh, so it is what our research direction goes. So it is one direction that's hardware, and the other one, which is uh, also very uh, interesting, and we are involved very much in it, is this image processing dedicated for medical images. So it is it is basically my two legs of my research are of interest. So now I will ask Shimon maybe the same. Like uh, you have uh, 15 minutes, I think it will be more than enough to present your specific area of interest. So. Please. Yeah. yeah, so before I start, just a few words about my interest. So as I have already mentioned, or have already mentioned, uh, I work, or I'm interested in the clinical decision support. Uh, so actually, what it means, it means applying, adapting, extending methods that are associated with our field of expertise, specifically uh, associated with uh, preference modeling, uh, data mining, uh, artificial intelligence in the old and, and new sense, and applying them to, uh, uh, to clinical practical problems. Uh, actually, this presentation or the research presented here uh, has been conducted with colleagues from other universities, so as you can well, therefore I, I believe in, in cooperation. So specifically, it's the School of Nursing and uh, the University of Minnesota and the uh, University of Ottawa. And what I would also like to, to stress that uh, quite many of the practical problems, they, they, uh, uh, they are real problems and we have physicians. And again, uh, these are mostly physicians from Canada uh, who cooperate with us. So we actually we tried to, to help them in solving their actual problems. Um, and this is one of, of the problems. I will go into uh, details here. The other, the other problems that we deal with are building diagnostic and uh, therapeutic models. And again, we have cooperation with physicians, mostly with the uh, emergency department. So they, they want to have models that could be used very early in the management process. So the patient comes in, and we would like to have very general diagnosis and also a quite general uh, therapeutic plan, which means, for example, that we only have a very limited amount of information. Usually there are no lab reports and no 
uh, image information, so we have only basic findings. So we try to build models out of these basic findings. And also, uh, it's very, I would say, very common in medicine that they want to understand the models. So, for example, methods or models like SVM neural network that are not very, they are not very suitable because it's very difficult to look inside and to extract the knowledge. Therefore, we focus, uh, or for quite a long time, we have focused on decision rules, decision trees, and other representations that could be, well, easily even translated to, to a paper format. And just interestingly, our first project was about building a decision model for, for, for clinicians, for, uh, uh, well, practitioners in the emergency department to help them with diagnosing uh, abdominal pain in children. And actually, the, the goal was not to build a computer system, but rather to have a set of, of rules that could be printed on a paper chart and just distributed among physicians. Uh, here, I would like to focus on another problem, which is uh, well, patients with multimorbidities and uh, supporting clinicians and applying multiple clinical practice guidelines to those patients. Yeah, so what are clinical practice guidelines? I guess uh, here I don't, I, at least, well, in the US it's not necessary to give you a, a very detailed introduction to clinical practice guidelines. There are very, yeah, I was quite surprised when I, uh, during my very first few meetings with, with clinicians here, I mean, in Canada, because they, they had those very huge, very thick books with, with guidelines. And in Poland, there is a different approach. Now it's fortunately it's being changed, but clinicians were not very eager, or they were they, they were not very willing to use guidelines. Here the situation is different, so there are guidelines, but guidelines are are focused on on specific diseases. So they, they support disease-specific patient management. They have multiple advantages, so they result in, in, in better care. Uh, they have positive uh, uh, impact on patient outcomes, and they also allow to distribute to adopt uh, evidence-based medicine, so the recent results of, of uh, research, and they improve adherence to standards. But actually, they have some limitations. So again, this is, a, I would say, kind of uh, psychological limitations, so sometimes physicians, and again, this is what I experienced, well, mostly in Poland, so they said, oh no, we won't use guidelines because every patient is different, so we cannot use schemes to follow them. Uh, so this is one problem. Uh, the other is that they are mostly given in paper formats. These are just publications, sometimes they are thin, but usually they are long documents, multiple pages, and only parts of those are uh, formalized. For example, they are given as checklists or, or, or graphs. Uh, so there is also limited standardization for, the, for those formal representations. There are several languages that could be used to build computer-based uh, models of guidelines, but again, there is no standard like, for example, HL7 that could be used everywhere. There are several groups that, that propose their own standards and, and uh, there is no winner here. And finally, uh, Typical guidelines, they, they provide or no support for, for multi-morbid conditions. So usually they, they focus on a single condition and they forget about all the other conditions. And this is uh, really a serious problem because uh, multi-morbidity is becoming a norm, especially in older uh, patients. So you can see some statistics. So patients, uh, when they, they pass a certain age threshold, they suffer from multiple problems. And if, uh, yeah, they, they have to be managed for these problems. And if physicians uh, follow, the, well, there were at least several studies showing that if physicians followed guidelines for a few most typical situations, typical presentations, then the total outcome would have been much worse, much optimal when not using the guidelines because of, uh, of the conflicts between uh, between treatments and uh, uh, because of adverse interactions. And actually, this, this lack or, or no support for this uh, application, concurrent application of multiple practice guidelines is one of the, well, major, major shortcoming and a major obstacle and practical adoption of clinical practice guidelines. So no, physicians know them, but they, uh, they do not rely on them. And interestingly, uh, the support for, mul for multimorbidity is one of the grand challenges for clinical decision support. So researchers, 
uh, they have been talking about this for at least the last 10 years. So, but it's still a, an interesting and a challenging uh, problem. And there is another aspect that is not directly related to multimorbidity, but it's also now becoming very important, and these are patient preferences. So now another, well, another buzzword, hot buzzword on the medical side is, uh, well, P4 medicine, some people talk about P7 medicine, so personalized, participatory, predictory, I don't remember all the piece, but what's important that now we treat the patient as a team of a member, of a, well, healthcare team member. So the patient has to participate in the management process and patient's preferences have uh, to be also considered. And actually, I'm not sure if you, if you heard about this EVM term, evidence-based medicine, which means making clinical decisions on, on the basis of evidence and experience. It seems natural, but it's apparently this is something what it gets highlighted very often in, in medical publications. So this is traditional understanding of EPM evidence plus experience, but now preferences are added to the mix. And they are becoming quite relevant when, for example, guidelines are quite vague. So they don't give very precise instructions, but rather rely on physician's judgment. So this is the place where we should uh, ask patient to participate. And, and what kind of preferences? For example, there are several uh, several possible treatments. And uh, I will show you uh, an example with uh, where one of the, uh, of the presentations is atrial fibrillation. This is quite common, heart arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. And actually you can, so there, are, there is treat, treatment for, for this arrhythmia, but also this arrhythmia is associated with a risk of stroke, so you have to take anticoagulation drugs. And for example, you can take warfarin, which is, for example, cheaper, but you have to go to the lab every two weeks to have your blood tested, and it may, well, it causes some, or you have to watch your diet, so you don't have to exceed a certain level of vitamin K. So there is one possibility. The other possibility uh, are, well, the class of drugs called uh, new, direct oral anticoagulants. So they require no blood testing, no diet monitoring. However, for, they are more expensive. So at least in Canada, they are roughly $3 a day, while I think uh, warfarin is refunded. And also, at least for some of them, so that they make your blood thinner, just uh, uh, simply speaking. But actually, it also results in the risk of bleeding. For warfarin, there are drugs that, well, they are they, they can that can quickly make your blood thick again. So, for example, if you need to go to a dentist, you can take this pill and then you can go quite easily. For some of those drugs, there are no such pills. So, actually, this is where, for example, a patient uh, has uh, become a, well a member of, of the team who makes a decision because usually those guidelines guidelines say you can give this drug, this drug, or this drug but you have to make a very specific decision here. And again, different patients may have different preferences. Now we were talking, for example, to a nurse from anticoagulation center, and she told us that, for example, there are patients who already paid, because you can also buy a machine for testing your blood. Uh, this, well, there is something INR that I, I don't, don't remember the whole explanation, but you can do those tests easily at home. But this machine is expensive, but some of those patients, they already bought it. So once they have it, they take warfarin because they don't have to pay for the drug itself, uh, although it's associated with some, well, difficulties. So again, these are very personalized decisions. So patient preferences first have to be discovered, have to be modeled, and finally have to be used to make uh, decisions. Uh, yeah, so faced with those, uh, with those challenges, we, uh, Asked, asked ourselves several uh, questions and goals. So the goal was to, to build a framework for personalizing CPGs for multi-morbid patients. And these, this framework should allow for indicating and, and addressing those uh, adverse interactions and also customizing therapies based on patient preferences. Uh, we had to ask, uh, to answer these specific questions. So for example, how to represent primary and secondary knowledge. So by primary knowledge, I, I understand uh, CPGs and secondary knowledge, knowledge. 
these are uh, interactions or patient preferences. And the other question was what reasoning techniques uh, to use to process this, this knowledge. So the answer was first order logic and then associated reasoning technique, techniques like theorem proving and, and model solving. Uh, I'm not sure if you are you familiar with uh, first order logic or so maybe I'll just skip it. Uh, what's what's uh, specific or relevant here is that well, it's logic. So you 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 represent your knowledge using logical expressions, but first you need to define your language, and this is a domain-specific language, and it consists of logical symbols. So these symbols have fixed meaning, for example, quantifiers, uh, and non-logical symbols. So these symbols are the symbols that are specific for the domain. So you have to create or design your, your language for your, for your specific problem. If you're improving, so you, well, we have a theorem, which is a collection of logical sentences. We have an interpretation that assigns meaning to non-logical symbols and then theorem proving. So we, look, we, we check whether a theory has a solution and we, we try to find these solutions. So basically this is what this uh, reasoning is about. Uh, this is our framework. Uh, the relevant, sorry, relevant components are, uh, oh, this is not clearly visible. So we have uh, guidelines represented as graphs. Then we trans, this box is not visible here, but we have a mitigation specific language. So this is, I would say, logic based representation, but customized for this specific problem. Here we build theory that describes our problem. We process it. Uh, we have information about revisions, so well, actually we have information about possible interactions, ways to uh, of addressing them, and also about patient preferences. So this is where our algorithm comes in, and as a result, we get a management scenario, which is a description or a scenario of possible uh, patient management. So maybe I will uh, jump over it. Uh, and just give you, show you a very brief uh, clinical example. So we have uh, here CPGs. Uh, yeah, so for, for our framework, we created a very basic representation, graphical representation of guidelines. So actually it abstracts or it's based on popular representations that are already used. So actually now it's, it's quite kind of easy to, to translate guidelines given in the other representations to our form. So this is a you know, guideline for chronic kidney disease. This one is for atrial fibrillation, so the presentation that I have already mentioned. And here we also have a guideline for hypertension. So this one is divided into, into several stages. So we'll consider a patient that will have to be managed according to all these guidelines. And actually this situation is pretty common, so it's not something that is unusual or never heard of. Uh, here you can see uh, well, a brief example showing an underlying logic representation of, of this graph. It's quite complex, but physician doesn't have to deal with this directly. So obviously we require a knowledge engineer that would translate this into this. To a large extent, this can be done automatically, but the clinician, physician, will not have to, to look at the logical expressions. So this one is a, some form of a data log, or like at least has some similarity. Yeah, that's right. Well, because it's logic there. Yeah, but well, so there are some some commonalities. Uh, data log is a specific language, but uh, yeah, um, now I don't remember it, whether it, it uses first order logic. But you're right. Yes. Yeah, these are so it's like a bit like Prolog, a bit like data data log. Um, here you can see revision operators. So they, they, each of those is then represented as a logical expression. So they define those uh, interactions and also ways of, uh, of addressing those interactions. So those ways just deal or introduce changes to, to guidelines. And again, the, here you can see uh, logic-based representation of, of one of the operators uh, and what it does. And now we have a situation when patient is, is uh, uh, suffers from these two presentation. Uh, so patient is at the well, I would say terminal uh, steps of the presentation. So actually, 
these treatments are treatments that are given for life. So duration is infinite uh, in all these steps, and those blue uh, lines show you uh, the management process up to date. This is for this is CKD, so kidneys. Here is hypertension. So patient is here, and suddenly patient suffers from uh, from uh, heart problems. So it's diagnosed, and it turns out this is uh, atrial fibrillation. And again, because here it's possible to use warfarin or other drugs. So this is a situation where, as I mentioned, patient decides to replace warfarin with apixaban. So patient is able to pay for this more expensive drug. Uh, and now our, our framework is invo involved. I didn't mention it. We use two procedures. Uh, one is customized, so this one modifies guidelines according to patient preferences, and the other one mitigates, checks for possible interactions, and then uh, modifies those uh, guidelines according to, well, identify interactions, and then it, uh, it uh, fixes uh, guidelines. Um, I think so actually here we have an interesting situation where we first apply revision, so revise guidelines according to patient preferences, but here it, it turns out that uh, there is an interaction. Once we modify a guideline equation according to patient preferences, it causes problems, issues according to medical knowledge. And to we assume this, that this verified medical knowledge is more important than patient preferences, therefore here we kind of cancel or uh, reject patient, well, uh, patient preferences. We introduce other uh, revisions to guidelines, and this is what we obtain. So here you can see uh, those uh, parts that are now part of, of patient scenarios. So some treatments were removed, some were modified. Mm. And just to well, just to summarize, uh, at least this specific. Uh, this specific research. So we propose a framework for modeling guidelines, for modeling preferences, and for supporting uh, application of multiple clinical practice guidelines to um, to patients with multimorbidities. Uh, as you could see, this logic-based representation is complex, but uh, but uh, the physician doesn't have to deal with it directly. So we plan to embed it into a clinical decision support system, and uh, we would like to test it in, in a hospital. And again, there are multiple places where this framework can be embedded.